Well, hello everyone. Uh, we're almost done. We will look through the second century and, uh, and step into the third where things will really begin to fall apart significantly. I mean, they will already begin to fall apart at the end of this century, but still, until the end, there'll be another two, three really good emperors. And so the entire second century was very positive, was, was very fortunate in, uh, in, in the Roman emperors and in their devotion to the cause, their, their devotion to, to the empire. Now, remembering uh, the difficulties that he himself had uh, with uh, being adopted by Trajan, Hadrian uh, made sure that he had his successors firmly in place. And uh, as a result, he assured the next the next pretty much uh, 30 years of, um, of fortunate successors. What he will do, I mean, Hadrian is right here, the one without the face, um, that's Hadrian. And he will adopt an adult man by the name of Antonius Pius. And then he also made sure that Antonius Pius, in his own turn, will adopt two men, two young men. One right here, uh, will become Marcus Aurelius, and uh, the other, who is still a young boy, uh, is uh, Lucius Verus. This composition, uh, this relief, which is quite interesting, it's, it's done frontally, but still in a classicizing uh, style. It comes, uh, uh, it comes from uh, a place in, uh, in Asia Minor, which is today Turkey, right here. It comes from, no, it comes from Ephesus. Yes, it does come from Ephesus, right here. Uh, Pergamum is to the north, Halicarnacus to the south, and Ephesus is right here, Rome here, under the Antonines, as this, um, as this new family will be called. Uh, there were fewer structures built in Rome and considerably more stru uh, structures built outside of Rome, in the provinces, and that, of course, included Ephesus. And in Ephesus there was built, uh, this is an, a, a lovely illustration by Balaj Balo, who, is, uh, who does um, uh, historical illustrations and who is very good at it. And here is his, it's called Archaeology Illustrated. And this is how he imagines the ancient Ephesus. And, should, and there's the Library of Celsus, the, um, the street of the Curitis. Uh, uh, and somewhere there, there is... Uh, a so-called Parthian monument is very, very similar of the Pergamon Ultra. And here's Ephesus, Pergamon is, um, is directly to the north. And this is what this altar looked like. And um, it also has a, a continuous frieze around that commemorates the conquests of Lucius Verus, who will be a co-emperor with uh, Marcus Aurelius and the um, his battles against the Parthians. It's always the Parthians. And this is, it commemorates it. Um, presumably it comes from uh, directly after the middle of the second century AD, whereas the Pergamon altar comes from second century BC, so about 400 years in between. Uh, this is the Pergamon altar, which was recreated in Berlin, and that's what it looks like. Ephesus is here. Here's Pergamum right there, and then Halicarnacus, we saw the mausoleum of Halicarnacus. So they're all here on the western shore of, um, of Asia Minor. Uh, this is another imaginative recreation of the Pergamon altar and what it may have looked like because, uh, remember, everything was, everything was colored, and uh, so was the case with the Parthian monument. All these um, elements were colored. Uh, while the Pergamon altar, uh, most of it, most of it is um, in in Berlin, uh, the Ephesus monument, most of it is in Vienna, and here it is, the Parthian monument in Vienna. They did not recreate the entire altar as they had done in Berlin, but they do have these very extensive, very high relief. As you see, the relief is so high it's almost sculpture in the round. So. You can imagine uh, 
how impressive it was because the light, uh, the play of uh, the light and shadows on such a high relief plus the color must have been remarkable. Um, and it is from that, it is from that uh, relief that, uh, that our dynastic group comes from. And as I said, here stands Antonius Pius, the next emperor, and uh, he wears the, uh, the garments, uh, priestly garments. And uh, next to him is uh, Marcus Aurelius, the emperor after him. And uh, he has his hand on Antonius Pius, to whom, in fact, the monument is dedicated, to whose victories it is dedica dedicated. And then next to them stands um, presumably Hadrian himself, who engineered this whole adoption process. And then behind is uh, is a woman who who, who may be uh, who may be Marcus Aurelius's daughter, Faustina the Younger, who will become the uh, the wife of Marcus Aurelius. So Antonius Pius acquired an empire. Uh, because he compelled the Senate to defy uh, Hadrian, or um, because he had saved senators sentenced to death by Hadrian in his later years. I mean, Hadrian, who was a very, uh, I mean, a humanistic man, but nevertheless, uh, as you remember, he executed uh, the architect of Trajan, who criticized him, and presumably in his later years he was also unhappy with certain senators and prescribed them, meaning um, sentenced them to certain death, essentially, and, uh, and Antoninus Pius um, saved them from that. So he acquired the name of Pius. And as I said, most of the structures that were built under the, uh, the Antonines, as they will be called, were built outside Rome. Not that much was built in Rome. One extremely interesting building is this Tiny little temple. Well, it look, looks tiny right here, and it is the temple of Antoninus and Faustina. Uh, now, apparently, they were extremely devoted to one another, the husband and wife, Antoninus and Faustina. Faustina will die in uh, 141 A.D., 20 exactly 20 years before her husband. Um, and it seems quite certain that uh, he was entirely devoted to her during marriage and, in fact, remained celibate um, after her death uh, and, uh, and cherished her memory. So after she died, he built the temple, dedicated it to her. But, but once he died himself, the temple was rededicated to both of them. And here it is. It's right next to Basilica Emilia, remember our Quaker Bridge Mall? And sort of catty corner, almost across from, uh, from the Temple of Julius Caesar and across the way from the, um, the Vestal Virgins compound. Here is uh, just the map of the, uh, of the Forum Romanum, the original Forum. And here you see the Temple of Julius Caesar, Basilica, Emilia, and right there, next to the Basilica Emilia, right underneath, was built this temple, which was of course prime real estate, and right on uh, on the main uh, on on the Via Sacra, on the main road, where all the triumphal processions took place. Here we back to our forum. The building to be recognized immediately is the Senate House, right there. Basilica Emilia, these are the ruins of Basilica Emilia, and right next to the Basilica Emilia, what looks like a Baroque church, is in fact the temple of Antoninus and, um, and Faustina the Elder. It's just what, what will happen is that they, they will leave the columns, and then in the uh, circa 1600, very early 17th century, they will give it a Baroque facade, which will in itself be very interesting. So we will look at this building right now. Then, as you see, there is um, there is a triumphal triumphal gate, and that's Septimus Severus, and which will be built later. So these two buildings are some of the latest buildings in the Forum. Here's the compound of the Vestal Virgins. Uh, the building here it was later dedicated to Saint Lawrence. 
Uh, here it is. And uh, as I said, it was originally dedicated to Faustina the Elder and then to both of them when, when, uh, when he died. Now, watch this. Uh, here is an inscription that tells us that it's dedicated to Diva uh, Faustina and Divo uh, Antoninus. Now, you see how far up uh, is the doorway. It's interesting because by the, uh, the year 1600, the ground rose so high that, in fact, it, uh, um, it concealed the podium, it concealed the stairs, and it concealed part of the columns. So the, uh, the level at which the doorway was made was the level uh, of, uh, of uh, the early, early 17th century, right here. After all the excavations, all of this was, was discovered, but it's still it's an interesting it's an interesting point. And this, as I said, this is the Baroque facade, but they left, uh, they left the columns. And uh, this kind of recycling uh, will, be, uh, will be often the case. Uh, Syracuse, in fact, in Sicily, has a cathedral that was recycled from uh, from an ancient Roman temple. And we also saw the Temple of Hadrian that had been recycled. Last time we saw the Temple of Hadrian that had been recycled into, into a new building. Uh, here it is. You can see from here, there is the doorway. That's what it looks like from the side. All of this, of course, is 17th century construction. Uh, this presumably what it looked like originally. And here is Antoninus and Faustina, and the whole thing of husband and wife and uh, devotion. Now, we saw it in funerary monuments of the plebeians, uh, of free slaves, but not really, not yet, of the emperors. But here, this is very much the case where the two of them are, are united. Roman imperial funerary pyres. We know about them from chroniclers from contemporaneous chroniclers, but also from coins, as always. And this um, golden um, reuse that shows Antoninus Pius right here, it shows it in the front, and then on the reverse, we see the funerary pyre. And it was built up as a spectacular architectural structure. And, uh, and then the emperor would be laid out on the top, and then on the very, very, very top, there would be a cage that would hold an eagle or two eagles. And as the fire uh, was lit, the cage and, and the fumes began to rise. Uh, the cage would be opened up, and then the eagles would fly out, taking the soul of the emperor or the empress with them. So as you see here, one, two, three, four, here, uh, here there are four levels and a quadriga. So it must have all been done in wood in order for it to go up to go up in flames. This is one of the recreations. Here, in fact, is only one, well, not, it's, there's several layers, but one block, one square block up on which a person is, um, uh, is reclined, and then the eagle, you see, is being let go. And then around the, uh, the pyre, there would be, a, uh, there would be a calcade mounted calorie that would uh, go around in the ceremonial procession. Probably the best representation of what it may have looked like is this absolutely enormous painting. It is something like 12 feet by seven and a half feet. It is in Prado in Madrid, um, Spain, and um, uh, it is done by an Italian painter, Dominichino. And here, uh, he sort of imagined what the whole thing... I, it's very possible that that's what it looked like. According to, as I said, con uh, contemporaneous writings, uh, it was decorated most splendiferously uh, with gorgeous tapestries around. All of that, of course, would be, um, uh, would be burnt. And then, as you see, the... Uh, the mountain cavalcade and uh, and quadrigas would circle uh, would circle the fire while it is burning, and then from the top the eagles would be released and uh, sent off into the air. So it was and it was done in the uh, field of Mars. So this 
the funeral rites of a Roman emperor. Now, what we do have left from uh, Antoninus Pius is uh, apparently a column was built uh, to commemorate his death and by, uh, by perhaps Marcus Aurelius, but not a relieved column. This is a base of the column and that, uh, that survived in surprisingly good shape. Here's what it actually looks like. Now, uh, on the other side, around the corner from this cavalcade, there's a, dedica a dedication to Antoninus Pius and Faustina the Elder, again together. They are together, always together, It's quite amazing. This is the apotheosis that we'll look at, and, and then on each side here, that's the cavalcade, and the, the mounted uh, ceremonial guard, and the other side also has the cavalcade. One for Antoninus, the other for Faustina. The approximate date is 161 AD, which is when Antoninus died, but remember Faustina died earlier. However, when the column was uh, erected, um, it was for the two of them, and which is quite unusual, even though the representation, the relief itself is, is still quite classical. But here, what we see um, right here on the left is an allegory, uh, <laughs> a rather suggestive allegory of uh, the field of Mars, right here, with the Egyptian obelisk uh, that rises from his groin. Uh, for the lack of a better word, and um, an Egyptian obelisk was a very prominent feature of um, the field of Mars because it was part of uh, uh, of this sundial that was erected by Augustus back there. So that's the allegory of the field of Mars. On the other hand, I mean, you by now you're already used to to this allegory. It is Roma. It is Roma that's dressed in her armor. And her shield uh, shows uh, the wolf, the she-wolf with Romulus and Remus. And she sort of says goodbye to the emperor and the empress. And here they are, both of them, right on top, being uh, with the eagles on each side, and e an eagle for each, one for Antoninus, the other for Faustina, and, uh, and uh, diagonally, diagonally, we have this allegory of eternity, perhaps, uh, that cuts across a winged allegory that uh, brings them upward um, to join the gods. Uh, so the eagles and the allegory and the two of them together, again, together. This is, this is different because until then there was always just one person. So this is quite classical. And then suddenly when we... Uh, uh, when we look at the at the sides at the cavalcade, um, we depart from the classical tradition altogether into what we had seen as a plebeian tradition. Really, here, as you see, everything happens on one ground level. I mean, obviously, this is uh, they all take off from one ground level. But then here, the entire side becomes the ground level, and in order to get to give the cavalcade ground, so to speak. Uh, these little pieces are arranged throughout the entire side of the of the monument. So that's very much a departure from classical tradition. Also in the apotheosis itself all the figures uh, are very much uh, in proportion and, uh, and adhere to classical standards and, and ratios, whereas that's not the case here at all. The, the figures are much stockier, the head's quite large, and as you see, the, the horses are really, really tiny. I mean, some of these horses almost, uh, I mean, they look, uh, these men's feet, some of them could touch the ground. Um, now, this, this tradition of um, uh, a smaller ratio for a horse as opposed to a rider really goes back to the middle of the 5th century Parthenon, to Phidias, but with him he observed all the uh, classical proportions within, within those irrationalities. And as a result, both riders and horses looked beautiful and it was difficult for the eye to catch the um, inconsistencies. Here, of course, it's very easy to do so. So that's what they have on both sides here. So Marcus Aurelius will inherit after Antoninus Pius. Marcus Aurelius and, uh, and his partner, Lucius. But Lucius will be away fighting the Parthians for the most 
part, but technically, yes, there would be two emperors, co-emperors, but Marcus Aurelius would be the, well, the senior one. Uh, the, uh, the greatest uh, monument that's left to us from, from his reign is this equestrian bronze statue, which is a miracle in itself that we have it, because as many as there were of those equestrian statues, uh, none of them survived, really, because, uh, well, the Christians, uh, the later Christians can consider them uh, pagan and as such not worthy of preserving. And then, but then, uh, an even stronger uh, argument was the, uh, the value of the material. Bronze was extremely expensive and always needed. Always needed for weaponry, always needed for coins, always needed in, in various constructions. So bronze was needed. And as a result, it was all melted down, all these monuments. Uh, this, however, was preserved because the Christians were convinced that this was not Max Aurelius, but Constantine the Great, of whom we'll talk in our last lecture. And he is the first Christian emperor. He will accept Christianity, well, presumably, on his deathbed. But he legalized Christianity, made it one of, official, of the official religions and was very supportive of organizing the church. So as a result, the Christians felt that was him, and as such, they did not destroy the monument. God bless them. <laughs> well, uh, he is one of the... Uh, uh, he was a Stoic philosopher. And um, here he is shown also as a benevolent, benevolent uh, emperor, He's not wearing his military cuirass, and he extends his arm. I mean, clearly there, there must have been, just as in, in the other statues, there must have been an enemy lying under the hoof of the horse. But whereas in, uh, in earlier statues, from what we know, this was a gesture of the execution, essentially. This is the gesture of forgiveness. And, uh, and obviously, it, it, it conveyed that, that multiple image of an emperor as a benevolent uh, uh, autocrat, no question, but sort of a father of the country who is charitable, who occupies many roles as an emperor, as a priest, as an administrator, and, uh, and combines in himself all the charities of the realm. And uh, I mean, and, but interestingly enough, here too the horse is of a smaller ratio than the man because his legs too, see how, uh, how low they, they reach. But because, just as the case was with Phidias back in the middle of the 5th century, because both men and horse themselves are in such perfect proportions of themselves that um, one doesn't really notice. Uh, it stood uh, uh, forever and ever in front of the Lateran, palace. And then in the 16th century, the, um, the Pope uh, Paul III insisted that Michelangelo transfer it to this beautiful, beautiful square on top of the Capitoline Hill. And there is our Marcus Aurelius. This is the design by Michelangelo with a sculpture in the middle. He actually hated uh, the whole idea of moving it, but well, the Pope tells you to move something, you move something. Um, so he moved it, and, and there again it sat uh, exposed to rain and snow until relatively recently, until about 20 years ago, it was, uh, it was removed by, uh, to this building on the right to the museums and a, a beautiful space was constructed for it. It was restored, of course, and now what we have in the middle of the square is a copy. Interestingly about Marcus Aurelius, unlike previous emperors, uh, he does show himself as aging. He, uh, at first, when uh, he is adopted by Antoninus Pius and he is still in his teens, and we see him in his teens right there. Then as he progresses into his 20s, he develops a beard, not a very large beard, but a beard nonetheless, so you see him in his 20s. And then as he grows older, he too is, uh, is wearing a beard. Remember Hadrian? was the first to sport the beard because he was a lover of all things Greek. So he wears a beard, but the beard is long because with Hadrian it was kind of carefully trimmed. This one is uh, a long beard. And then just before his death, and I mean he died at 59, not, not really that old, 
but he spent so much of his time on the German frontiers, the barbarian frontiers, which and he was a man of peace, that's the interesting thing, but he had to do what he had to do. And he wrote uh, the mediation, which still are vastly uh, readable. There, that's where he is today, in the, uh, in the capsule museum, in this beautiful, beautiful round space with a window uh, on top. And, uh, and you see here that no military cross uh, and the uh, the arm is extended in a benevolent gesture. Lucius Verus, who was his co-emperor. So there he is, an incredible amount of hair, and uh, a longish, a longish beard. Well, the Antonines clearly had an incredible head of hair, uh, and the drills were really used to, to show the hair. He died in 169, and but was co-emperor with Marcus Aurelius. So this was the first time when uh, the Roman Empire was actually ruled by core emperors. It will become it will become a very very common feature, but this was the first time when uh, when that happened. Marcus Aurelius was married to Faustina the Younger, who was uh, who was considered a, sort of an exemplary, very virtuous woman. Now. We also need to remember that the two greatest virtues in a woman at the time were considered, number one, her beauty, number two, her fertility. And according to different sources, uh, um, Faustina had something upwards of, uh, of, of ten children, perhaps, but it was uh, Commodus uh, who, uh, who was groomed, presumably, from a young age to be a successor of Marcus Aurelius, which is kind of odd a bit, uh, because throughout the second century, uh, a, a tradition developed of adopting a very capable man to be the next ruler, whereas uh, Marcus Aurelius, who was a, a brilliant emperor and a philosopher, but, uh, but who broke that rule. And uh, even stranger, Given the fact that from the very young age, uh, Commodus was considered a very ill-behaved, uh, cruel, egomaniacal uh, child who had absolutely no interest in, uh, in anybody around, uh, only in himself. So there were clear signs that perhaps not the best choice for the uh, future emperor but uh, nevertheless, uh, emperor he did become, and very much in the tradition of Caligula and Nero and Domitian, and in the same tradition he was assassinated. When he grew up, he uh, was convinced that he was very much a god. He made the Senate acknowledge him as uh, Hercules incarnate, and uh, fashioned himself as such. He, he loved the gladiatorial battles and participated in them, which of course was to a great disadvantage to gladiators who obviously could not, uh, could not exercise their full powers against, um, against the emperor. That film, The Gladiator, in fact, is about Commodus. Um, he does not die the way he does in the movie. Let's just—he does not die in the, the stadium. Oh right, but he was assassinated, nevertheless. Right. Yeah. Uh, we have this absolutely tremendous, spectacular bust. The bust is spectacular. The man was not. Well, the bust is spectacular, but I call this his frat bro photo. <laughs> I mean, all he's missing is a red solo cup. The gentle little pause. I mean, he just looks right. so manicured. Yeah, but that too. Uh, underscores the brilliance of the sculptor. No, absolutely. That he incorporated psychological as well as uh, yeah. as physiological defects. Um, actually, it, it was with, with Marcus Aurelius, really, when we first mm -hmm. see uh, sort of psychological uh, fatigue in the face of an emperor. All the Antonines had these very, very heavy lids, as you see. They all have these heavy lids that give them a bit of a, a sleepy expression. And uh, uh, the, uh, the sculptors also begin to use the drill to emphasize the pupil in the eye. It's called the coloristic um, uh, impression. And, 
And so this is the first time when you see that. Technically, this is an absolutely brilliant bust. It shows him, yes, he has uh, the, the skin of the Nemean uh, lion on his head. Uh, he has the apples of the Hesperides, which was the last task of Hercules, and the club, the Herculean club. Then it is supported by, um, uh, by two horns of plenty, right there. Then the scallop, the scallop shield of um, the Amazons, and then there were two Amazons on each side. One is uh, one has broken off and is lost, but then the other one, uh, there's no head, but um, otherwise preserved. And then uh, the lion's skin is knotted up on his chest. Here you can see these are the two cornucopias, horns of plenty. And here is the one Amazon that uh, is left. And she's done there beautifully also. Almost, I mean, one, one could almost feel that she comes from 5th century BC with her wet drapery that, uh, that, that gently curses around her breasts. Really beautiful. Commodus erected a column uh, to commemorate uh, Marcus Aurelius. Uh, well, you obviously see where the column comes from. It's uh, it's a copy of the column of Trajan, and uh, just as in the Trajan campaign, the column depicts two campaigns against the Dacians. Here, too, uh, the depicted campaigns against Germanic barbarians. Uh, it's different in the sense that, uh, well, for one thing, they learned their lesson, the sculptors. So the strings themselves are much wider and the relief itself is, uh, is deeper, and of course all of it was colored. But then from the psychological point of view, interestingly, while the column of Trajan depicted the, uh, the foe as noble and, uh, and courageous, which of course made it all the more noble and courageous of the Romans to defeat them, this column doesn't. Even though Marcus Aurelius uh, really met with fierce resistance, but uh, but the foe is uh, depicted as meek and, and easily conquered. So those are the differences. Uh, just as the Trajan column today has St. Peter on top, this one to has St. Paul. With Commodus, the good emperors ended. Um, so we had uh, Nerva, then Trajan, then Hadrian, Antoninus Pius, then Marcus Aurelius, and after an assassination of Commodus, inevitably there'll be a civil war. Uh, protracted, less protracted, that, but there'll be a civil war. The next emperor would be uh, uh, Septimus Severus, who was born in uh, North Africa, in, uh, in Libya, and who actually <laughs> uh, had the gumption to proclaim himself as the son of uh, Marcus Aurelius and the brother of Commodus, after he defeated uh, other pretenders um, to the throne. He's the father of Caracalla, uh, who will be assassinated and who in, in turn will assassinate everybody who stood in his way. So things are beginning to disappear. We are now into the third century and things are beginning to disintegrate very, very quickly. Here's some information for you to read uh, uh, about Septimus Severus and his wife, uh, Julia Donna. And uh, here is um, here's Caracalla, right there, with his brother, Geta, whom Caracalla will assassinate and uh, uh, not only he will assassinate him, but then he will erase his face. It's, again, the damnation memoriae, and that's why we don't see the brother right here. In fact, Commodus, after he was assassinated, also will be damned. His memory will be da damned, but once Septimus Severus comes to the throne and pronounces himself as uh, the son of Mark Aurelius and the brother of Commodus, uh, he will resurrect Commodus's uh, name and, uh, and, uh, and, and even have his uh, official uh, sculptors carve some of the uh, images. This is actually a tempera, uh, a tempera painting that comes from Egypt, but uh, we can imagine that these um, the wooden panels with uh, the images of emperors and their families 
were probably uh, very common. It's just that because the material is so perishable, um, there aren't many left. We're very lucky to have this one. And Septimus Severus himself paints him, I mean, has himself represented essentially with a youngish face, but the hair is gray, so he uh, he's not shy of representing himself. Aged, um, his, uh, his wife right here, Julia Donna, was a very powerful woman in terms of imperial wives. She, uh, she, she probably had similar power that Livia had, who was the wife of um, Emperor Augustus. And then Caracalla, of course, will be uh, the next emperor. Uh, Septimus Severus will not be uh, will not be assassinated. But interestingly enough, when you really think of the followers of. Uh, Marcus Aurelius, Commodus will be assassinated. Uh, Commodus will assassinate whoever was around. And then uh, Septimus Severus, who will come next, will die a natural death, but everybody else after him will be assassinated. And thus it opens up the third century of, uh, of really uh, of great strife, great uncertainty, uh, no great leaders. Uh, and, uh, and and thus we'll arrive at the uh, at the last century really of the empire almost the last uh, at the fourth century. Okay, um, here it is. You can see it here. You can see Julia Donna, Septimus Severus, and uh, actually look at his forehead. He has these three little uh, squiggles. And uh, now he's from North Africa and starting with Egypt and throughout North Africa. And in Rome as well, a worship of Serapis, which is sort of a combination of Osiris and Apis both. The priests uh, had these little uh, squiggles on, uh, on their heads. So this shows that he perhaps, because all Roman emperors, of course, were also priests, high priests, that uh, he kept the tradition of Serapis. The uh, representation on coins, as we saw, lots of coins, and of course all these emperors wished to be represented on coins because it's such such, such a great propaganda. What's interesting here about this coin, however, is that uh, Julia Donna is represented uh, frontally. And remember, usually on coins, one is represented in profile because coins go through many hands and then uh, they wear out. But if the ear wears out, or a bit of a cheek, that's uh, the man is still re or woman still recognizable. Whereas, of course, when uh, when the nose gets uh, worn off, that's uh, not as good. But nevertheless, this is uh, she is represented frontally, sort of as uh, on this portrait. And then uh, there is this, uh, I mean, delightful sculpture of I mean, we don't know Caracalla uh, as. As Hercules. Uh, Hercules was the son of Zeus, an immortal woman, and uh, possessed, of course, tremendous strength. Uh, Hera, the wife of Zeus, hated him and, uh, and, and kept sending uh, all sorts of impossible tasks to him. And uh, when he was still in his cradle, she sent two serpents to his cradle, which what serpents he uh, smothered with his two hands. Now, uh, as we saw, Commodus also uh, fancied himself as, um, as Hercules. So we're not quite sure whether this is really Caracalla or perhaps uh, it was done posthumously uh, to represent Commodus. But it's just a delightful little baby with a, with a snake in one hand. Presumably there was a snake in the other hand also, but it's not there anymore. The Antonines all built triumphal arches, lots and lots and lots of tri the triumphal arches, because, again, they were billboards to proclaim their achievements, both military and administrative. Uh, so we have some of the reliefs from, uh, from these arches. The arches themselves are gone. Later on, in the fourth century, uh, the first Christian emperor, Constantine the Great, will, in fact, recycle some of those reliefs on his own arch, the Arch of Constantine, that still survives. But this is a relief, for instance, when he is introducing both, uh, both his sons, Caracalla and Geta, to the Senate. 
Uh, here, he, here sits uh, Septimus Severus himself. He uh, he lacks uh, he lacks uh, his head, and then behind him, the tallest on the podium is Caracalla, and then next to him is Geta, also without the head. And here are the senators to whom they are being introduced, and then um, a triumphal arch. They just came through uh, through the arch, and in the spandrels, those triangular things here. In the spandrels, of course, are victories, victories that always show the the achievement of the ruling family. And again, it's the same message: uh, not to worry. There will not be a civil war. Succession is uh, is assured. And that's what what this means. Uh, Lawrence Almatendema, who is uh, who was a brilliant 19th century painter, and painted a number of these um, of these beautiful uh, ancient scenes. And here uh, here is his uh, image of uh, Caracalla and Geta in the uh, in the Colosseum. So this presumably is Septimus Severus, Caracalla here, a younger boy, Geta. Uh, right there. This actually was painted in the early 20th century and this is just beautiful paintings. Uh, well, here's uh, here's Caracalla. Perhaps the sculptor meant to represent him psychologically determined, uh, powerful, strong, but um, <laughs> couldn't help himself and uh, he certainly he, he, he came out pretty frightening. And he was cruel, capricious, murderous, willfully uncouth, and lacking in any sort of civility or loyalty. And of course, the portrait portrays it all. Um, there's a great difference uh, in in the in the treatment of hair. The hair is very uh, closely cropped to the head, and then the beard too, as as opposed to. Marcus Aurelius and Antoninus Pius and Lucius Verus, uh, the beard is also very closely, in fact, so close, uh, closely uh, sheared to the face that uh, that the sculptor in this case used sort of the negative relief. Uh, it's what we talked about cameo. Cameo is positive relief because it's relieved from the stone, whereas intaglio is negative relief. You carve into the stone. So this is what uh, the sculptor did here with his beard. It's, it's, it's kind of a <laughs> negative relief. After Caracalla, there'll be, uh, there'll be others. There'll be uh, someone called Alagabalus, and he was a relative of Julia Donna, in fact. Uh, again, very self-willed, uh, cruel, uh, uh, megalomaniac also was assassinated. Caracalla was assassinated. He was assassinated. Uh, claimed to have been Caracalla's son. Uh, another uh, Almatadema painting, uh, The Roses of uh, Heliogabalus. And when one talks about the decadence of the Roman Empire, one, one talks about uh, someone like him. Uh, now, under Septimus Severus, uh, uh, there was uh, I mean, Septimus Severus was, as, as the rest of them were, uh, concerned with restoring the, um, the old Roman monuments, in particular the Forum of Peace, the Vespasian Forum, and building other temples, and of course, as I said, uh, many, many triumphal arches. But um, having restored a uh, Vespasian temple, probably part of it was given to uh, as headquarters of the prefect of the city, because uh, uh, under uh, under the ruins of the uh, of the forum, there was found this extraordinary thing, and it's called the uh, Forum Urbis Roma, which is which is the map of the city of Rome. So the the prefect of Rome had uh, it was done in in marble, so it was really found in in small pieces. But it was a plan of Rome, as uh, as it was back then in the um, uh, circa 300. It may not have been extremely precise, but nevertheless it had given the archaeologists tremendous, tremendous um, uh, field uh, for investigation and conjecture, because certain streets are uh, delineated there, um, uh, temples, triumphal arches, uh, uh, whole insulas, whole blocks, and uh, so the theater of Pompeii, the reason we know what it looks like is because it just it was happened 
to be depicted on on this plan, on this map, uh, on one of the uh, of the pieces of the marble that that actually survived survived quite well. So it's um, it was originally it was engraved on 150 marble slabs and originally measured at 60 feet by 43 feet. So you can imagine it was enormous. Uh, but this is what we have today. But as I said, the uh, I, the orientation uh, is interesting because it's the orientation is south is is uh, where our north is. South is at the top and north is at the bottom. And it is of great use. Here it is. You can see here Campo Marzio, the field of Mars. Now, as I said, the other monument that we will see is this arch of Septimus Severus. Right there, next to the rostra, over here, was erected this arch uh, of Septimus Severus. Uh, here's the reference table and you can see what's where. Remember, this is the arch of Augustus and Augustus won a diplomatic victory against the Parthians, he, not the military victory. But Septimus Severus actually went to war and conquered Mesopotamia, so he decided to hearken back to the founder of the empire, who was Augustus. So here's the uh, Arch of Augustus, as you see, and cat a corner across, uh, diagonally across the entire forum. He built his own arch right here. And it is also uh, the arch with the three uh, uh, passages. So it was difficult not to remark on uh, on the similarity is just that the Augustan arch remember the uh, the lateral passages were pedimented whereas here these are all arcuated and essentially the the attic talks about Septimus Severus of course his family his achievements and then the entire arch all the reliefs are dedicated to Parthian victories and then and this is Via Sacra, so the, uh, right after his triumph, he built this arch. And, um, and I remember Nero built another arch uh, higher up the Capitoline Hill. Uh, that arch did not survive, but as you remember, we know it from coins again. And what, uh, uh, what Septimus does is he adopts the freestanding columns on the arch from the Nero's arch. So these columns right here are in fact uh, freestanding. So and the arch has survived. Severus uh, Alexander, he actually uh, reigned for something like 15 years or so, but ultimately also assassinated uh, at the age of uh, at 26. Um, all, so all these later emperors will meet violent deaths. By this time, the interesting thing to observe here is, uh, is that the toga now is worn slightly differently and uh, the toga now has, uh, has this band that goes from the left shoulder and then under, under the right armpit. And this is the new, this is the new style. Back to Caracalla because uh, one of the most significant um, buildings and still uh, very significant um, under under Caracalla were the baths. They all wanted to build baths because I mean Romans wanted their pools and they wanted their hygiene. I mean that's the one thing they absolutely demanded. So Caracalla built an enormous enormous complex of baths and they called the baths of uh, of Caracalla. I th uh, I think Septimus Severus may have started them, but Caracalla. Uh, completed the buildings the building and uh, and this these baths completely overshadowed all the baths anywhere uh, they were truly tremendous today the caldarium the caldarium was right here uh, has been used for, um, for 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 concerts and here is the the caldarium the usual thing the caldarium tepidarium frigidarium and then the pool right there Palaestras on each side, but this was just one part of the baths, right here. But then this entire area, there were concert halls, lecture halls, um, there were various museums, there were galleries, there was absolutely anything and everything. 
that social, that human civilized social life uh, desires. Uh, it, 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 was, it was quite extraordinary. And um, so this is, this is the look of it. This is what it looks like today. Um, this is the, res just to give you an idea, this is the restored view of the pool, like the most tremendous basilica, uh, basilicas in fact. Until now, um, there is this, this constant friendly argument. I mean, did the baths come first, the basilicas or basilics or the baths? And then, uh, who, I mean, which architecture was inspired by, by which, but possibly in the end it was really a vicious circle, or not so vicious, a beautiful circle. But this is uh, uh, the restored view of, uh, uh, of the pool, right here. Uh, here's another one, uh, and uh, my chief, my pet peeve, the Penn Station, the New York Penn Station was in fact built with the baths of Caracalla in mind. It was a spectacular building. It was the building sort of, you know, you come from New Jersey, you come from Pennsylvania, uh, you feel like a king when you, when you walked into that building uh, very much differently from today. But um, it only existed for 50 years. It was built in 1910 and it was destroyed uh, tragically uh, in 1963 to give, uh, uh, to give place to modernity and the modern building that, that we have there today. But uh, here is the original Penn Station and uh, the front with Imperial Eagles. And this is the inside. They wanted to destroy the Grand Central as well, which and, and the Grand Central was was in fact less impressive than the Penn Station. But but fortunately, in fact, Jackie Onassis, um, with all her uh, supporters, was successful in in pulling together uh, enough influence uh, to stop the plans of destruction and, in fact, to begin the whole preservation process and uh, the uh, the historical monument process. He also, I mean, all of this is the Pennsylvania station. Back to the Baths of Caracalla, and uh, this is probably one of the most famous concerts that took place there, and it's called the Three Tenors. Uh, the, uh, here's, here's Carreras and the Pavarotti and Domingo, and then Zubin Mehta was conducting. So spectacular was the building, uh, everything, everything was, was the most beautifully done, whether mosaics or sculpture or uh, marbles, plaster. Uh, so there are some, uh, some mosaics uh, from the Baths of Caracalla of some sea creatures, the, um, the tritons and seahorses, and uh, another very uh, another favorite design, little putty. Uh, riding on, on dolphins, uh, more just floral design right here. Uh, this is some geometric design that still survived. And uh, there are also figural designs on the mosaics and those were of athletes. And these athletes were appreciated uh, at that time in the Roman world which were very different from the Greek athletes. The Greek athletes were always represented as as um, as elegant uh, and uh, and proportional, whereas these we see them very stocky and very very powerful, sort of more like our football players or or wrestlers, but nevertheless still very much true to type. Um, here a number of them, and then the very famous Farnese Hercules, who now lives in Naples in the archaeological museum also was dug up from, uh, uh, from the baths. And uh, he, is, he is tired. This is after his last labor, the golden uh, apples of, the, um, of Hesperides. And he holds them in his uh, right, right hand behind his back. Uh, he is leaning on his club and his lion's skin is wrapped around uh, around the club. It's it's a tremendously powerful body. Again, it's uh, presumably a copy after Lysippus, who was a Greek Greek sculptor of the fourth century B.C. and specialized in athletes. Here he is. Here's the front, and here's the back with the uh, 
with the apples. Uh, some just to show you some uh, images of, uh, of what the baths may have looked like. And here too. I mean, there were palaces, really. There were just tremendous palaces. And when Renaissance uh, embarked on building their own palaces, that's what they were looking at. That, that, that's uh, when they were lucky enough to, to read contemporaneous chroniclers on what all this uh, looked like. They eagerly embraced these descriptions and uh, realize them in their own palaces. And thus we've pretty much covered the second century. As I said, the third century is going to be very, uh, very sad and the empire will be falling apart. Um, towards the end of the century there'll appear a couple of emperors who will attempt to bring it all together using, um, well, autocracy, essentially, and military power. And they'll succeed for a while, not that long, the capital, in fact, will be moved from Rome to Constantinople. So this is, this is going to be the beginning of, uh, of the next Roman Empire, what, what will be known as the Byzantine Empire, while um, the bar barbarians, uh, the Germanic barbarians, the Huns also from the east, will um, descend upon the western part of the empire. Thank you very much, and I'll see you soon and uh, I'll post uh, what needs to be posted.